our next speaker is Professor Craig Boyd of St. Louis University. He is a familiar face at Urbana Seminary's Tolkien Conference. And Dr. Boyd has published several books on, my note here says virtue ethics. Is that correct, Craig? Yes. Okay, on virtue ethics through publishers such as InterVarsity and Oxford University Press. Dr. Boyd has also published articles on Tolkien in a variety of peer-reviewed academic journals. And his current presentation is titled Saruman's Sophist Wow, I can read. Saruman's Sophistry and Gandalf's Wisdom, Augustinian Rhetoric in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. At least that is the most recent title I have. You may have changed it. So take it away. <laughs> uh, thank you, Melody. It's, it's, it's always changing. So, so there's that. It's a, it's a very fluid project, let's say. Um, this is part of a, a larger project that I have going, which is a series of essays on uh, the nature of virtue and vice in, uh, in Tolkien's works. And uh, uh, some of the things I've worked on so far are the vice of curiositas uh, and how that affects uh, characters like uh, Saruman and Denethor and Pippin. And uh, the uh, humility of Master Samwise, uh, the wisdom of Gandalf, and um, the uh, first essay I had published was on uh, the Thomistic virtue of hope in uh, Leaf by Niggle, uh, which uh, I blame uh, Melody uh, partly for uh, getting me going on this. So it's, it's, it's partly her fault here. So, But uh, one of the things I find particularly interesting in, uh, in uh, Tolkien is the way he gives what you would call kind of a phenomenological uh, account of the virtues and the vices. And uh, that is a kind of a description in characters. Now, of course, uh, Tolkien was very careful to try to avoid allegory, but uh, I'm going to say that uh, it uh, doesn't mean that there is an applicability. And his, uh, and his um, approach is, I think, uh, deeply indebted to his uh, own Catholic uh, um, convictions, if you will. And so I started out working with the work of uh, Thomas Aquinas, and we know that uh, Tolkien had a copy of Aquinas's Summa Theologiae, which uh, was given to him by Father Francis. And he also had uh, uh, a number of uh, Augustine's works in his, uh, in his library as well. So that we, we know that he was uh, thoroughly versed in the, in the Catholic uh, intellectual tradition, if you will. And uh, so I'm particularly interested in this aspect of the virtues and vices. And as uh, Sarah uh, pointed out really helpfully earlier is uh, I, I think one of the interesting elements of the account of virtues and vices in the, in the Catholic tradition is the importance of affect. So if you look at some of these vices uh, like uh, curiositas, it's, it's not a vice of the intellect. It's a, it's a vice of desire, if you will. And uh, if you look at the virtue of hope, uh, it is also a, a virtue of desire as well. So it's not so much about knowing the right thing, but this kind of uh, very helpful uh, synergy between uh, intellect and affect, if you will. So this is part of my, my larger project. And uh, so uh, what I got interested in here was uh, the idea of the virtuous orator. And, uh, and this comes from uh, the text I'm looking at primarily is uh, the fourth book of Augustine's On Christian Doctrine. And of course, uh, Augustine was trained as a rhetorician. He wasn't trained as a philosopher, wasn't really trained as a theologian, but he was trained as a rhetorician. And uh, this, I think, is uh, particularly interesting because uh, he's very much indebted to Cicero. And uh, he even uh, mentions Cicero and uses uh, Cicero's methodology. But, but I think there are some uh, other interesting aspects uh, that are uh, his own due to his own uh, Christian faith. But I'd like to uh, start out by talking a little bit about uh, battle scenes in, uh, in uh, Tolkien. And of course, if you've seen uh, Peter Jackson's adaptations, uh, these are some of the most uh, memorable scenes uh, in, in the movies. So you can think of uh, Boromir's valiant death at uh, Amon Hen when he's uh, defending uh, uh, the little hobbits. And uh, uh, there's the battle at Helm's Deep, which is, uh, which is a fascinating uh, account of the, of the battle there. But, uh, I, uh, as an aside, I like uh, Tolkien's account uh, when uh, uh, himself and not, uh, not Jackson's where uh, Tolkien uh, says of Theoden, uh, I refuse to be taken like a badger in a trap. 
And so there's a certain kind of uh, uh, orality uh, to uh, Tolkien's language that I particularly like. And then of course, there's uh, my, my favorite scene and probably the favorite scene of, of many people here, which is in the Battle of uh, Pelennor Fields where uh, Eowyn, uh, with what we might call an assist from Meriadoc, uh, kills, the, um, uh, kills the Witch King of Angmar. So uh, if you'll forgive my... Uh, uh, soccer, or uh, as they say in Scotland, uh, football uh, illusion there. Uh, Meriadoc certainly gets an assist, but it is Eowyn who, uh, who does the, uh, who, who finishes off uh, the Witch King. So, um, so there's this, uh, this conflict, and uh, this is uh, the Greeks called the Agon. And uh, if you look up in the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll see that an agon uh, can mean a, uh, among other things, a spiritual struggle. Uh, it might be a speech delivered before an assembly. It could be a verbal contest or dispute between two characters. Uh, and uh, as uh, Francis Cornford, the uh, famous uh, uh, Plato scholar says, it's often between, quote, the hero and the villain, uh, unquote. And I think that's a particularly uh, helpful way of uh, thinking about Saruman and Gandalf. Um, uh, but in any case, an agon is a painful struggle. And uh, some of you uh, probably uh, no, that uh, the word protagonist and antagonist uh, both come from this notion of the agon, uh, this, this Greek idea that goes back uh, at least uh, to uh, Aristotle to some extent, but is developed more in uh, uh, the Latin authors Quintilian and Cicero. Now, this is one of the uh, uh, interesting, I think, elements of uh, Tolkien scholarship, or the lack uh, thereof, is that um, there's very little said about uh, Tolkien's use of rhetoric. Uh, Tom Shippey uh, makes kind of a, an aside in one of his famous works. He says that uh, the rhetoric of Saruman sounds almost like a modern uh, politician. And don't worry, I'm not going to get into politics today, so, so we'll just leave that aside. Uh, but there are only really two other uh, essays that have been written about Tolkien's uh, rhetoric, and those are by Jay Rood and Chad Chisholm. And these are, these are excellent essays. And uh, they, these two, though, however, deal primarily with Aristotle's account of rhetoric. And so for those of you who are familiar with Aristotle, you'll know that Aristotle appeals to uh, three elements uh, for the, uh, uh, the great er uh, orator. And uh, the really great orator will appeal to pathos, ethos, and logos. Of course, uh, pathos is this ability to connect uh, uh, affectively uh, with one's audience. And of course, pathos is this idea of, um, uh, in Latin, it's uh, the idea of uh, being pathetic or being able to be moved, uh, literally. Uh, and uh, Aquinas talks about this notion of the passionis anime, uh, which means we would loosely translate this into emotions. And he says there are 11 of these uh, that, uh, that we can appeal to, and, and they are natural to us as, as uh, animals. And, uh, and uh, I'm not gonna go beyond the 13th century or 14th century because my knowledge of uh, psychology beyond about the 1300s is really limited. So, so we'll just leave it at that. But, but it's this connection to our, uh, to our emotions. And then there's ethos and uh, Aristotle speaks very briefly about it. And, uh, and Cicero is much more helpful here. And he says it's the um, ability of the speaker to establish uh, his own character or their own character as, uh, as being reliable and as being trustworthy or, or authoritative. And then of course there's logos. And, uh, and as most of you know, uh, logos is the uh, term in John's uh, prologue for uh, the divine word. And so in the beginning was the reason. Uh, uh, but uh, you will see that uh, Aristotle appeals to, to that as well. So these three, and it's a, it's a very interesting kind of uh, synergy among these, among these three. However, I think that, uh, and, and uh, Rude and uh, Chisholm uh, both appeal to that, and it's very helpful, I think. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think an appeal to Augustine uh, might be a little bit uh, more helpful in this regard, because Augustine has a specifically Christian account of rhetoric, and that Christian account is going to appeal to his own notion of the true and the good, and of course the true and the good are found in, in God, and so there's a certain kind of teleology 
that shapes Augustine's account of rhetoric uh, that is different than Cicero's that's different from uh, Aristotle's. And so uh, I thought about, um, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, renaming uh, this talk, uh, The Agony in the Fantasy. And so thinking about how uh, this notion of the struggle and it's a struggle for the true and the good and how uh, Augustine really uh, develops that in his own uh, particular uh, and unique way. So, so what I wanna talk about then is uh, a little bit about the two key encounters uh, where we have uh, Gandalf and Saruman. And of course, the first one is uh, Gandalf uh, at the Council of Elrond uh, retelling the story of how he gets uh, captured uh, by Saruman. And uh, the second one is uh, the account of uh, after, after the Battle of Helm's Deep. And it's in the chapter, uh, The Voice of Saruman. And uh, that, that title of the chapter itself gives it away in a sense, uh, The Voice of Saruman, which is uh, particularly interesting. And so uh, as, um, and just as an aside here also, as Charlie was talking earlier about, uh, about Lewis's influence, uh, I think uh, on the, uh, the Orthanc encounter, the second encounter, I'd be particularly interested uh, if uh, he knows or if anyone else here knows uh, much about that in terms of the, uh, the way the rhetoric is shaped. I'd be particularly interesting, uh, interested in that. So, but the first encounter, and uh, in this first encounter, it's, it's uh, Gandalf retelling the story. And of course, it's, it's Gandalf's narrative. We don't have the, uh, you know, the third person omniscient perspective. But Gandalf, uh, you know, we don't have any reason to believe that he's an unreliable narrator here. Okay, so we're, we're already, you know, as the reader, we're already trusting Gandalf. But uh, a little bit about wizards. Uh, we get a background in Unfinished Tales. Uh, Tolkien tells us that wizards were to persuade rather than to dominate in their mission to Middle-earth. And he writes that the Astari uh, should not overwhelm others in terms of coercing them to do good, but, quote, coming in shapes weak and humble, humble, I should, I should probably emphasize that, were bidden to advise and persuade men and elves to good and seek to unite in love and understanding all those whom Sauron should he come again, would endeavor to dominate and corrupt." End quote. But Saruman, as we come to see, seems to use his own rhetorical skills in a rather coercive manner. Uh, moreover, this coercive language is couched in the context of persuasion. But Gandalf, uh, however, resists uh, the temptation to do this. So the reader first hears of Saruman's wickedness as narrated through Gandalf uh, as the gray wizard recounts the story at the Council of Elrond. And Gandalf explains that he had ridden to Orthanc because he was given a message to go to Saruman by one of the other wizards, Radagast the Brown. And Radagast tells him to go as quickly as he can to Orthanc in order to consult with Saruman concerning the Black Riders who are, were at that very moment riding north to the Shire in search of the One Ring. When Gandalf arrives, he feels something is wrong, but he can't really articulate why. But as he engages Saruman in conversation, he starts to become more and more suspicious. And he says a haughtiness appeared in Saruman's voice, which, which made him even more uncomfortable. And the white wizard quickly reveals that the message from Radagast uh, to go to uh, Orthanc was based upon a lie. He derisively refers to Radagast as Radagast the fool who played the part that Saruman wanted him to play. And this was simply to get Gandalf to go to Orthanc because of course Saruman knew all about hobbits and he knew all about this and Saruman wants to co-opt Gandalf. In the course of the conversation, Saruman reveals that he is no longer Saruman the White, but Saruman of many colors. Gandalf responds laconically with, I like white better. <laughs> But Saruman objects that white is merely a starting place, that the white light can be broken. And then Gandalf utters those most famous lines that he that breaks a thing to find out what it is has left the path of wisdom. 
Saruman then argues that it would be wise to join the new power, that is Sauron, because of two reasons. First, there is hope in doing so. And two, or secondly, Gandalf will have power. Saruman says, we can bide our time. We can keep our thoughts in our hearts, deploring maybe evils done by the way, but approving the high and ultimate purpose knowledge, rule, order, all the things that we have so far striven in vain to accomplish, hindered rather than helped by our weak or idle friends. There need not be, there would not be any real change in our designs, only in our means. Of course, as a philosopher, I read that and I think, well, you know, Saruman sounds an awful lot like a utilitarian, you know, the ends always justify the means. But even Saruman's ends are corrupt because Saruman desires power. And it is this, which I think, and I've, I've argued elsewhere, is the most corrupt, uh, the most corrupting aspect, uh, at least as Tolkien sees it, uh, the desire for power. Remember, it is the ring of power. It is the one ring. And it is this desire for power that corrupts people. And of course, those who refuse the power are those who are virtuous. So we see that, that Gandalf, Frodo, for 99% of the time, he has the ring, <laughs> resists it. Sam resists it. And we see that those who resist it are those who are the most virtuous. Of course, it doesn't mean that these characters are perfect, that uh, they were without uh, some kind of uh, basic flaws, moral flaws, but that is critical. And it is uh, this idea here that, that Saruman wants power and he wants to achieve it by any means possible. So, so Saruman has as his end design this idea of power and domination. And of course, we see this even in defeat when we go to the scouring of the Shire, which uh, in, in my opinion is probably the most, uh, uh, that's the worst part of the film adaptations because we don't see how things are truly resolved, how Mary and Pippin and Frodo and Sam come into their own as mature moral uh, characters. Uh, uh, they really become round characters uh, in, in that very last chapter, but Saruman even then, after his staff has been broken, after everything has been taken away from him, he's still clinging on to the power of wanting to control the Shire. So what Saruman wants from Gandalf, of course, is the location of the ring. But Saruman fails to understand Gandalf. As one who already possesses great power, Saruman also assumes that Gandalf wants the same things he does. He assumes that Gandalf will be open to his arguments because he assumes that Gandalf not only desires the thing, same things he desires, but also thinks the same way he does. And as we see, Saruman is wrong on both counts. And of course, Gandalf rejects Saruman's offer. Uh, he knows that only one person can use the ring and that the one person who rightfully uses it is the most corrupt being in all of Middle-earth. Further, those who try to use it invariably are corrupted themselves. And of course, we see that Saruman's just the mere desire for the ring has already corrupted Saruman. So Saruman in his position of power imprisons Gandalf until Gandalf, uh, he hopes, uh, can see the error of his ways. And this illustrates, once again, uh, Tolkien's idea uh, that he expresses in one of his letters that power and coercion are to be resisted. He writes to Naomi Mitchison that the supremely bad motive for this tale, since it is specifically about it, domination of other free wills. The enemy's operations are by no means all goetic deceits, but magic that produces real effects in the physical world. But his magia, he uses to bulldoze people and things in his goitea to terrify 
and subjugate. This is exactly what Saruman does. Uh, next to Sauron, Saruman is, of course, the, uh, the chief villain, the chief antagonist. But what's really interesting about Saruman is you get insight into him, I think, that you don't get into Sauron. But Gandalf accepts the imprisonment rather than being co-opted and betraying his friends, and he stays there, and, of course, until his rescue and return to Rivendell. Now, the Agon here is not a battle uh, between the wizard's use of their goetic powers, their magical powers, but it is a war of words. It is a battle of persuasion. And of course, this is really kind of the, the first uh, encounter, and it really sets the stage for, for the latter ones. Because the second and uh, more significant scene takes place after uh, Theoden's forces win the Battle of Helm's Deep. The victors then travel to Orthanc, where Treebird, Treebeard and the other Ents have destroyed the fortress and have trapped Saruman in his tower. As they go towards the tower, Gandalf turns to Pippin and says, beware of his voice. Now the scene is, I think, a uh, very good example of a rhetorical agon between the two great wizards, where Gandalf emerges victorious, but not without significant struggle because of course a struggle is what an Agon is. And Gandalf's method is very interesting. He is very quiet at first, and then he gradually begins to speak. And then as he speaks, he ends up gaining more and more power in his, uh, in his uh, uh, conversation and in his argument. Tolkien writes, suddenly another voice spoke, low and melodious. It's very sound and enchantment. Those who listened unwarily to that voice could seldom report the words that they had heard. And if they did, they wondered, for little power remained in them. Mostly they remembered only that it was a delight to hear the voice speaking. All that it said seemed wise and reasonable, and desire awoke in them by swift agreement to seem wise themselves. When others spoke, they seemed harsh and uncouth by contrast. And if they gainsayed the voice, anger was kindled in the hearts of those under the spell. For many of the sound, of, uh, for many, the sound of the voice alone was enough to hold them enthralled. But for those whom it conquered, the spell endured when they were far away. And ever they heard that soft voice whispering and urging them, none were unmoved, none rejected its pleas and its commands without an effort of mind and uh, so long as its master had control of it. Saruman employs the power of his voice to persuade and lure the unwary listeners in. His appeal is not to truth, but to a kind of weakness in his listeners. He is after all the one who initiated the war with Rohan, but as he speaks, he skillfully turns the narrative to make it sound as if he is the aggrieved party. Tolkien points out that it was only with a significant effort that any of them could resist the voice. Saruman remonstrates with his listeners to leave him in peace. He claims to have done no harm. He is the victim, the wrongly accused and aggrieved. And yet even as the injured party, he still offers his help a seemingly gracious offer presented by an unjustly injured person. He tells Theoden, I alone can aid you now. Theoden's writers are persuaded by the argument Saruman offers. The assent to his wisdom and the apparent folly of Gandalf, who had never spoken so fair and fittingly. So great was the power that Saruman exerted in this last effort that none that stood within hearing uh, were not moved. But now the spell was wholly different. They heard the gentle remonstrance of a kindly king with an erring but much loved minister. It is Gimli who breaks the silence with his insight when he exclaims, the words of this wizard stand on their heads. This angers Saruman who almost loses him co his composure and then turns to Theoden in his request for peace. Aomer also sees through the ruse and objects. And Saruman gives in to his anger, but still composes himself. Theoden finally speaks and rejects Saruman's argument and concludes with, 
I fear your voice has lost its charm. Harsh as an old raven's, their master's voice sounded in their ears after the music of Saruman, they thought. What I find particularly interesting here is the connection between Saruman's voice and Saruman's cloak. Saruman's voice and his argument shifts with his position and his condition, just as the colors of his cloak shift with his movement. So he is uh, a very wily character uh, that has to be uh, dealt with. So his robes adapt themselves to the perceiver's abilities. As Tom Shippey notes, quote, no other character in Middle Earth has Saruman's trick for balancing phrases against each other so that incompatibles are resolved, end quote. The words and their rhetorical power like his robes shift according to his designs. It could be said that multiple colors confuse the gaze in a way like his multiple words confuse the ears of his hearers. Gandalf's white attire, as he reveals shortly, stands in stark contrast, unwavering and pure, like his white cloak. Gandalf's words are plain, unadorned, simple, and true. So let's take a look uh, in this section on Augustine's rhetoric, Augustine's rhetorical style. Despite the fact that he claims in book four of On Christian Doctrine that it isn't a treatise on rhetoric, it certainly is a treatise on rhetoric. So we should not listen to what he's saying there, but we should pay attention to what he's saying. So regardless of his stated purpose, Augustine's teaching on rhetoric uh, orbits two main ideas, the moral goodness of the orator and the Ciceronian approach to speaking. Uh, yet it is always the goodness of the speaker that takes precedence for Augustine. Following Cicero, Augustine accepts two general approaches concerning the orator's purpose and method. First, he thinks that the role of the orator is to teach, delight, and persuade. And if you listened to uh, very carefully to how Tolkien describes what Saruman is saying, uh, the way he says it, uh, Saruman is trying to teach, of course, he's trying to teach something false. He does delight them and he delights them in a profound way. And he is persuading them, especially those who are uh, the most weak-minded. But second, he thinks that the method should fall under uh, what Cicero calls the subdued, the moderate, or the grand. And this is exactly how Gandalf proceeds from the subdued and the quiet to the moderate to in the very end, very grand and uh, very stern and very profound. But with regard to the purposes, the, su the successful orator will simultaneously teach delight and persuade. And of course, for Augustine, this is uh, about the Christian scriptures and the faith of the Christian church. Each of these are necessary conditions for a successful orator. And since speaking and listening are transactional, there will be an important element of audience response uh, to the orator in terms of listening intelligently, willingly, and obediently. So to teach well concerning that which is true and good, uh, we must keep in mind that uh, there is a reality, there is a truth that can be achieved, that can be obtained, that can be perceived by both the orator and the audience. And to do uh, otherwise is to betray one's uh, sense of vocation, if you will, as, as an orator. And this is uh, one of the first things that distinguishes Saruman from Gandalf. Uh, Gandalf is concerned with the true and with the good and will only use those means to achieve that purpose. Saruman is only concerned with his own uh, particular or private, uh, we should say, advantage. The orator must also, uh, must also delight those who hear his words. Uh, although the teaching may be true, if they do not hold the attention of the hearers, uh, they'll be disregarded. And Augustine asks, who would wish to hear him unless he could retain his listener with some sweetness of discourse? And that's exactly what Saruman does. Uh, Augustine says, uh, adds that, nor should it seek only to please, but it should also move the listener to obey. 
And this is the connection to the Passiones anime in Aquinas, and this is what you would also find in Augustine in terms of his account of the emotions. You must be moved from uh, stasis to action. And uh, that is uh, critically important. Otherwise, the, uh, the orator is, is not accomplishing uh, their task. So the true orator will move the audience to action. That is, they will obey, uh, they will only obey the delightful instruction of the orator. It must be first heard and understood and then heard with delight. And finally, it must, that delight must move the hearer to action. Where, and then Augustine says, where the hard heart is to be bent to obedience through the grandness of the diction. And if it is not heard intelligently and willingly, cannot be heard obediently. So there is always a very important second person perspective that uh, takes place between uh, the speaker and the audience. And, uh, and this, uh, this has to take place. Otherwise, there's, there's no point in speaking. Augustine says, what therefore is it to speak not only wisely, but also eloquently, um, uh, eloquently except to employ sufficient words in the subdued style, splendid words in the moderate style. And if you haven't uh, words in the grand style, while the things spoken about are true and arts to be heard, we must of course do that. But he who cannot do both should say wisely what he cannot say eloquently, rather than say eloquently, what he says foolishly. So for Augustine, the bottom line is, if you can have both eloquence and truth, yes, please, we would like that. But if you can only have truth, go with truth, because eloquence without truth is going to land you in a lot of trouble. So lying behind the orator's abilities and wisdom is choosing the best method of persuasion. Uh, and it is the orator's character, uh, and this does in fact harken back to Aristotle's ethos, uh, but more so Cicero's. The moral life of the orator and not his technique should determine how we weigh the words of the speaker. And Augustine writes, the life of the speaker has greater weight in determining whether he is obediently heard than any grandness of eloquence. For he who speaks wisely and eloquently, but lives wickedly, may benefit many students, although, as it is written, he is unprofitable to his own soul. Saruman was wise in a sense, according to Tolkien, at least originally. And as we have seen, he possessed a great deal of eloquence. Of course, elsewhere, uh, we find that Saruman is known as uh, Kurnir, and this means man of cunning. Uh, Orthanc uh, means in Middle English, a uh, uh, tower of cunning uh, work. And so we find Tolkien is playing with this notion of Saruman, who is a person of cunning, who lives in a place created by cunning, but to be cunning is not to be the same as to be wise. And his rhetoric is a kind of culmination of his cunning, a kind of shrewdness, uh, if you will. So uh, Saruman's life uh, was not wise in a moral sense. Um, uh, and even though he possessed a great deal of eloquence, his own life was one of murderous attempts to seize power. And this, as Augustine would say, did nothing for the benefit of his hearers or for the profit of his own soul. So the good rhetor is the true philosopher, that is one who genuinely loves wisdom. Augustine's account, the goodness of his life benefits not only himself, but others who look to him. And he says, quote, let him so order his life that he not only prepares a reward for himself, uh, but also so that he offers an example to others in his way of living, as it may be uh, as much as his eloquent speech. And he says, to teach what is right and to refute what is wrong is the goal of the true orator. And to emphasize this point, Augustine writes, the work that I am speaking of ought to be undertaken by one who can argue and speak with wisdom, if not with eloquence and with profit to his hearers, even though he profit them less than he would if he could speak with eloquence too. But we must beware of the man who abounds in eloquent nonsense, so much the more if the hearer is pleased with what is not worth listening to and thinks that because the speaker is eloquent, what he says must be true. Saruman is in fact the man, uh, or wizard as the case may be, who abounds in eloquent nonsense. 
So how can Gandalf respond to this persuasion? After all, Saruman's, uh, after all, Saruman's most concerted effort deceitfully appeals to the common good. And of course, in Catholic social teaching, <laughs> the common good is uh, preeminent. Tolkien writes, so great was the power that Saruman exerted in this last effort that, that uh, none that stood within hearing were unmoved. But now the spell was wholly different. They heard the gentle remonstrance of the kindly king with an erring but much loved minister, but they were shut out, listening at a door to words not meant for them, ill-mannered children or stupid servants, overhearing the elusive discourse of their elders and wondering how it would affect their lot. Of loftier mold, these two were made, revered and wise. It was inevitable that they should make an alliance. Gandalf would ascend into the tower to discuss deep things beyond their comprehension in the high chambers of Orthanc. The door would be closed and they would be left outside, dismissed to await allotted work or punishment. Even in the mind of Theoden, the thought took shape like a shadow of doubt. He will betray us. He will go. We shall be lost. Then Gandalf laughed. The fantasy vanished like a puff of smoke. Saruman, Saruman, said Gandalf, still laughing. Saruman, you missed your path in life. You should have been the king's jester and earned your bread and stripes too by mimicking his counselors. Gandalf does not speak with eloquence. He does not speak with the melodious euphony that Saruman possesses, yet he does speak the truth. Moreover, the method, the response of laughter, and the pointed rebuke are sufficient to defeat Saruman. Instead of taking Saruman's invitation seriously, or he does take it somewhat seriously, and in so doing, he responds with laughter. His response with mirth, which is also a response born of wisdom, in so doing, Gandalf does exactly what he needs to do. Augustine points out that a wise response need not be conventionally eloquent. It may be simple and to the point. He writes, quote, just because it marches to battle without embellishment or armor and apparently defenseless, this does not prevent it from crushing the enemy uh, with the strength of its sinewy hands and disabling its opponent and des demolishing falsehood with its mighty limbs. The Aegon proceeds with Gandalf moving from initial silence to mirth and then to authority and speaking in the grand style, but still always speaking the truth. In a sense, Gandalf's rhetoric picks up momentum. In a rage, Saruman recognizes his defeat and turns to leave. Yet the Aegon has not ended. Come back, Saruman, said Gandalf in a commanding voice. To the amazement of the others, Saruman turned again, and as if dragged against his will, he came slowly back to the iron rail, leaning on it, breathing hard. His face was lined and shrunken. His hand clutched his heavy black staff like a claw. I did not give you leave to go, said Gandalf sternly. Gandalf then declares Saruman cast out of the council. He deprives Saruman's robes of their color and he breaks Saruman's staff. Gandalf does in fact crush the enemy. The work that I'm doing right now with Saruman and Gandalf and Augustine and the rhetoric, this is very much a work in progress. And the more I read Augustine, and the more I go back and read the chapter on the voice of Saruman, uh, the more uh, little nuggets I find. And so uh, as I am developing this, I would be happy for uh, comments, uh, criticisms, and uh, any helps th that you might have and things that uh, I have missed uh, in any of the other texts. But I've tried primarily to work with uh, the letters uh, that Tolkien offers uh, you know, that the very famous uh, volume on the letters, as well as these two uh, particular uh, pericopes. And so uh, thank you uh, very much for your attentiveness. Thank you very much for uh, staying after lunch because I know 
this is often nap time for many of us. I know it is for me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. That's excellent paper. It had a lot of really good things for us to think about in it. Um, we have two questions here. And if anybody else is thinking of one, go ahead and send it. So I'm going to read the first one and we'll see what we get. Did Saruman's sophistry then come from his being evil, and so the verbosity was a product of his moral character, just as Gandalf's wisdom produced a speech that is morally good? In this sense, are Saruman and Gandalf subject to a correspondence theory of the mortality of rhetoric, much in a pre-Socratic faction, or is it because Gandalf's speech comes from the good, God, whilst Saruman's comes from that which is against the good, Satan, Melkor? Uh, that's a great question. Um... I would, uh, if I could appeal to Augustine once again and to a different work, The City of God. Um, you know, the members of the City of God are, are, uh, are divided from those who are members of uh, uh, the City of Man by uh, the object of their love. And I think, um, and I probably did not emphasize this nearly as much as I should have, and that is uh, the basic teleology in Augustine. And that is uh, those objects of love uh, are, are absolutely profound because they orient us in ways uh, that, are, uh, that, that shape who we are. So I think if you could say uh, necessary changes being made, Gandalf is a member of the city of God because he loves that which is truly good, uh, good with a capital G, uh, if you will. And Saruman uh, is enamored uh, with himself and um, this, I think, is, uh, and, and again, this is, this is very much Augustinian in uh, uh, my essay on Curiositas. It's this idea of, uh, uh, with Augustine, there's very much this notion of uh, the gaze of the soul, the aspectus mentis, uh, uh, that you can find throughout his work. And so whatever captures one's gaze captures oneself. And this is why, um, you know, aversio, aversion, perversio is a looking away, a looking within. And the only solution for that is conversio, is returning the gaze to God. And so uh, this is actually, uh, Tolkien actually uses that phrase gaze uh, frequently in regard to Saruman uh, looking into the Palantir, looking into all these other things. And so his gaze is captured by something that is beyond his capacity, uh, something that is not good for him. And so there's very much this, uh, this orientation to that which is evil, that which is less than the good. And so I think in so doing, uh, then everything else is, uh, if you will, uh, it, it disintegrates in a sense, it is disordered. Uh, and so it is that fundamental difference in the teleology, uh, that orientation to the good and the orientation to the self, I think that distinguishes the two. That, that would be my kind of Augustinian riff on that, if you will. Excellent, thank you. Here's another one, it says, great paper, Dr. Boyd. Could you say something about bad power versus good power? What is power exactly? And what makes it either bad or good? Too often in contemporary social discussion, the term power is used vaguely, making it not very useful. Uh, that is another <laughs> great question. So there are two or three questions I think uh, are, uh, uh, are nested in there. Uh, let me start with uh, Tolkien's account. Uh, if you read his work uh, in the uh, letters, for example, he is um, he's particularly hostile to someone like Winston Churchill. Now, I don't know if any of you have been watching that series, The Crown. Um, I've been kind of addicted to that myself, but uh, of course, uh, for for many people in uh, in Great Britain, uh, Churchill was uh, was a, a hero. And uh, I remember as a small child living in Glasgow, my, my father uh, uh, filmed the funeral of, Ch uh, of Churchill because it was that important. And, uh, but, but Tolkien says uh, he calls uh, Churchill a ruffian. Of course, a ruffian, if you go th to the OED, you'll be kind of surprised to find that it's basically uh, a ruffian. Uh, one of the definitions, one of the key definitions is uh, uh, a, a pimp uh, who is protecting uh, 
you know, a, a house of ill repute. Uh, that's what a ruffian is. And he refers to Churchill that way. So I was a bit taken aback. And, and Tolkien says, it is this desire for power, this desire to dominate and control other people's lives. And of course, there's a famous line who says, not one man in a million is, uh, is qualified to do so, uh, least of all those who desire to do so. And so there's a, there's, he uses this uh, famous line that uh, nolo episcopari, uh, I do not wish to be the bishop as the qualification to, to be bishop in the Middle Ages. And so nolo hero isari, I do not wish to be the hero is the qualification to be the hero of a narrative. And, and so you've got this uh, immediate distrust of the desire for power. And this is why I think affect is so important uh, in Tolkien's works, and I think it's so important in, in virtue and vice ethics, is that it is this desire. So um, even a desire to do good, and I think I think this is uh, I think this is what is shown in someone like Boromir and Denethor, is that they have a desire to do something good, but even then it corrupts them. And so uh, power for Tolkien is this desire for uh, domination and to control oneself. I think in a more generic sense, uh, power is just simply the ability to accomplish one's purposes. And so in a sense, of course, uh, Gandalf has power. But what I think particularly interesting about Gandalf is that he uses persuasion and the one time he does not use persuasion is with Gollum when he puts the fear of fire in Gollum and he gets Gollum to uh, reveal uh, you know, something. But it's clear that Gandalf uh, regrets doing that. Uh, and so it is the power of persuasion that does not coerce another person's will. I think is the good, is the good use of power. Of course, it's, you know, we're you're not talking with a two-year-old or a three-year-old here where you tell them, you know, don't touch the stove kind of thing is, is very different. You're, you're engaging people uh, who are mature. And I think that there is a coercive use of power in, even in, uh, in Saruman's uh, rhetoric. It is, it is a kind of magic. And as I, I mentioned to you, Meg, <laughs> or Schmidt uh, last week, I think there's a really interesting parallel between the Agon, between um, Gandalf and Saruman that there is in Lewis's uh, silver chair between uh, Puddleglum and the Green Lady. Uh, of course, the Green Lady is using much more uh, obvious magic uh, in terms of trying to uh, uh, stupefy uh, the children in Puddleglum. But I think there's a very, very similar kind of thing going on there. It's a kind of coercive ability to dominate another person to get them to do what you want them to do rather than to let them choose to do the good so excellent thank you we did just get we just got one more question um, that just came in it says would you care to talk about grimo worm tongue and perhaps denethor this idea of good counsel rhetoric used in the service of the common good is actually spread out in lord of the rings um, I think uh, one of the uh, papers I've just finished is on Denethor and despair. Uh, and I think it's really, uh, Denethor is really kind of uh, in very much, you know, of course, there are all these, uh, there are all these uh, dualisms, there's you know, parallelism, Denethor with Theoden, you know, the, you know that, that type of thing. Um, I think the problem with Denethor is that uh, he takes only his own counsel. Uh, his, uh, there is, uh, he only listens to his own persuasion. Uh, he is in a sense, I think, uh, immune to the persuasion of, of others. And there is a kind of um, uh, self, uh, a kind of autonomy that is, that is really uh, unhealthy. Uh, with, with a Grima worm tongue, um, I, I, I think that the I, I, here's another place where I, I don't like the movies as much as, as the book, because the, the movie makes it seem like there's a lot more magic going on. But I think Grima is particularly adept at, uh, at being a bad rhetorician. He is, uh, he is the, the, um, uh, he's the student, really, of Saruman. Uh, and of course, you find you know, those words repeated uh, in the uh, Meduseld that's repeated in Orthanc. Uh, you know, those, those very same things are said. Uh, 
and um, so I'm uh, I'm not sure if I've uh, answered that question or not, but uh, but I do see that there's a there are rhetorical devices here uh, that both of them are using, but I, I think there's a kind of self sufficiency that Denethor has, uh, trusting <clears throat> himself rather than listening to wisdom, and you know I think there's uh, one of the aspects of wisdom or is is hope, and that's those are the two things I think of. Uh, in terms of uh, Gandalf, that he's got the virtue of wisdom and the virtue of hope. Mm -hmm.